So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. One, one huge strength of, of MASK is that it's global. And we want to give you a warm welcome to our webinar, um, Cancer Associated Thrombosis, Optimizing Patient Care and Navigating Clinical Challenges. So I'm just going to tell you about the, 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 the agenda. Um, and first of all, I will tell you a bit about MASK because it's great. We're open um, today with non-members as well as MASK members. And we've got two wonderful experts with us to, to, to give us talks. And then what's, what's most promising is, is our um, discussion at the end with your questions and answers. Then we'll try and answer them all. But if not, we can answer them after. So just say our first speaker is Professor Florian Scotti, and he's from Institute Gustave Roussy in, in Paris. And he's a professor of medical oncology, but with a brilliant division, brilliant name for a division. So it's inter, interdisciplinary patient pathway division. And I wish we had one of these in our hospital. And he's going to talk about recent developments and they really are recent because he's bang up to date with, with last week's um, publications. Then our second talk is Professor Simon Noble, ensuring patient-centered care in the management of cancer-associated thrombosis or CAT. And, and Simon um, is well known to everybody in, in, in cancer-associated thrombosis and is Professor um, of, um, what are you Professor of, Simon? Professor of um, Supportive and, and Palliative Medicine at the University of Cardiff in Wales in the UK. Okay, so MASP, you know, Multinational Association of Supportive Care and Cancer, two big things about it. I've said one, that it's global, and also that it's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. And CAT is a huge clinical problem that we're all professions are involved in as well. So lots and lots of different folk, not just doctors and nurses, but as you see, lots of dietitians as well. And huge benefits of membership. And the study groups are really, there, there are 16 study groups that I'll show you, but really the engine room of, of MASK, where, where a lot of education and, and research is done. And there, um, you'll get these slides and see all the benefits. So here are the study groups. So 16, whatever your interest is in supportive care, you can find it here. And there are three subgroups as new topics come on, like immunotherapy, there are new subgroups, um, exercise for, for survivorship um, study group as well. Um, this is um, different, different payment methods, and I see that the retiree membership is free, so that would be good for me. I didn't know that, and and for um, you know lower lower membership fees are, are none for low and middle income countries as well, and we must take them into consideration because most of the trials that you're going to hear about are done in high income countries. And come to our meeting. This is a hybrid meeting, so you can join virtually or or come in um, in June the 23rd of this year for, for our mass meeting. And some of the highlights are post-COVID, disparities in supportive care solutions needed, and that's throughout the world as well. Big data, patient empowerment um, that we're going to hear about today, and burnout and oncology. I'm now going to hand over to, to Professor Scotty and he will give us um, the lecture on the, the updates. Thank you, Florian. Uh, for the invitation, I hope you see my screen. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much, here are my disclosures. Uh, it's a great pleasure to discuss VTE because it's a huge topic in uh, oncology. And as uh, uh, Annie, as you asked me, I will discuss uh, with the, the view of the oncologist. So uh, this is the last study published uh, in the chess journal uh, two or three weeks uh, ago by Benjamin Planquette, a French uh, physician. Uh, and uh, it was the Casta Diva. Casta Diva was uh, a non-inferiority trial comparing uh, uh, rivaroxaban to uh, um, baltiparin. Uh, this, that was a non-inferiority trial and the non-inferiority was not reached by the, by the, the, the trial, but they could uh, provide us 
a very interesting meta-analysis of the five most important last studies in the VTE uh, comparing uh, um, uh, LMWH uh, treatment to, uh, to drugs. Uh, so we have these, those five uh, studies, Select D, Octuzai VTE, Adam VTE, Caravaggio, I will discuss Caravaggio uh, in the next slides, and Casa Diva, the last, the last one. Uh, we compared Dalteparin uh, to uh, Edoxaban, to Rivaroxaban, and to uh, Apixaban. And as you can see on that screen, in this uh, may, short meta-analysis, uh, VTE recurrence seems to be more in favor of uh, DOAX, uh, but uh, in terms of major bleedings and uh, most of all in terms of clinically relevant bleedings, uh, it seems that uh, LMWH uh, are most are more um, uh, used uh, to to uh, are the best treatment to uh, to avoid bleedings. So, if I move to the next slide, I will go to the Caravaggio study. You see it, yes. Uh, so Caravaggio study was published by, by Agnelli in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020. It was a very interesting study because uh, it was a large study, a great cohort, uh, a non-inferiority study comparing apixaban uh, to dalteparin, uh, as you can see on, uh, on the, the screen. The results are here. Uh, Non-inferiority was reached. Uh, so dalteparin uh, was equal to uh, apixaban in uh, uh, treating patients with uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, um, proximal uh, thrombosis. And uh, as uh, you can see, there was no difference in terms of uh, VTE recurrence and no difference in terms of major bleeding, non-inferiority, I mean. Because if we move to the detail of the, of the study, uh, we can have several discussions and maybe we will discuss that uh, after, at the end of the, of the two talks. Um, so, uh, first of all, we had no details in the principal uh, publication, uh, but uh, if we move to other publication, we had information on uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors treatments. So you can see that uh, there was an imbalance between the, the two cohorts uh, with less patients under uh, CPI compared to the uh, dantepirin cohort, and there was no specific uh, outcomes to those patients. So if uh, we move to the lo location of the, of the cancer, you can see that uh, we had the less upper GI cancer patients in the apixaban uh, cohort, and uh, it was exactly the same for patients with uh, genital urinary uh, cancer. So it could give some uh, uh, discrepancies in, in, uh, in uh, uh, looking at the, at, the, at the results, but that was not significant in terms of comparing the two cohorts. So the next slide is about uh, other uh, Items, uh, uh, kidney failure, we had uh, more patients with kidney failure in the dalteparin cohort, more patients with pulmonary embolism, with history of VTE, and the ACOG was uh, uh, in the baddest, uh, set, baddest status in the, for, for patients uh, in the dalteparin cohort. So it could have an impact on the results that were presented uh, with, with uh, the, 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 the non-inferiority um, demonstrated. And uh, it, it gave us the, the opportunity to, to, to discuss for many months around the, around the results. So this is one thing, in my opinion, very important to consider is the age of the patients. As you can see, um, the risk of, uh, for, for patients uh, was for, uh, better for apixaban uh, treatment for patients uh, below say, 60 years old. And uh, for elderly patients, it was better to use dalteparin. Why we have to discuss it? Is it because of uh, communications? Is it because of other uh, symptoms? And the, the, the last slide, as you will see um, at the end of my talk, uh, will uh, give you some uh, uh, things to discuss. So just to remind you that VTE risk in various cancers is different between lung cancer, between uh, breast cancer, and between pancreatic cancer. And this, in that uh, very interesting study with a very large cohort more than uh, 100,000 patients uh, enrolled in the, in the study, you can see that pancreatic cancer is at the very highest risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. It means that we have to think of thromboprophylaxis for those patients. So in the next slide, I will discuss the immunotherapy, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, treatment. Uh, so as you can see on uh, that slide published in, in blood in 2018, it was interesting that we see that uh, um, uh, patients with VTE 
had the lowest survival uh, compared to patients without VTE in uh, uh, under uh, immunotherapy uh, uh, treatment. If we move forward, we have this very in uh, other publication published uh, in the annals uh, three weeks, three years ago, sorry. And you can see that the occurrence of VTE in, uh, in uh, this court was 8% of the patients. So patients under immunotherapy have a risk to meet uh, venous thrombobolism during the period of their treatment. And there is another very important uh, message is that patients with symptomatic VTE have a worse overall survival compared to patients with, uh, with a no, not symptomatic VTE. And this was a significant result. In the next two slides, we have uh, uh, from the, the, the team uh, of Barcelona, uh, very, uh, very good results. The first one is on lung cancer. And you can see that the impact of thrombosis, I mean, venous and arterial thrombosis is uh, uh, at the, the, the score of uh, 8.7% uh, percent of the patients. And we can see the increased risk of thrombosis for patients with a low hemoglobin, with anemia, with a, a, a network field lymphocyte ratio uh, above um, five, and uh, a thrombosis between diagnosis uh, and, uh, and the start of immunotherapy. And you can see also the same result than previously demonstrated that patients with thrombosis have a lowest survival compared to patients without thrombosis. We have the same results for patients with melanoma uh, treated with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see that uh, the, the, the rate is 6% uh, of patients with uh, thrombosis and uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, LDH and uh, the ratio above three are at highest risk to uh, meet thrombosis during the treatment period. So what about drug-drug interaction? Drug-drug uh, interaction is very important uh, when we use uh, drugs and we have this uh, uh, sub-publication from Caravaggio study, you can see that there was no effect of anti-cancer agents on VT recurrence uh, uh, and uh, major bleeding uh, under apixaban and daltepan. So the non-inferiority was met with uh, patients under uh, anti-cancer treatment with no impact. Okay, it's good. So we can use uh, daltepan, uh, LMWH, or we can use apixaban or DOAX without considering any drug-drug interaction. Okay, that's an interesting result, but if we uh, go to the specific detail of the uh, consideration of drug-drug interaction, we can see that if we have inhibitors of CIP3A4, we have an increased risk of bleeding. And we have, if we have inducers of uh, um, the, the, same, uh, the same way, then we can have a reduction of efficacy of the treatment. And in the table published by uh, um, Audrey, Le, Audrey Belser, sorry, uh, two years ago, you can see that it will depend on the treatment. So it's very important to discuss the treatment with the pharmacist, with the pharmacologist, uh, when we, we decide to um, enroll a patient in a, a trial uh, in a, with a new treatment and uh, if the patient is uh, under anticoagulant. So we have to discuss, is there drug-drug interaction or not? And then we have to decide and to define the best treatment to prescribe to, to our patient. So this is another uh, publication that, uh, that highlights the fact that uh, patients with uh, uh, inhibitors have uh, a bleeding risk uh, uh, increased compared to patients uh, uh, without uh, inhibitors. And it's because we have this uh, balance. We have to look to a malabsorption, to non-compliance, to a, a induction or a inhibition, to renal, dis renal dysfunction, uh, overdose of treatment, and uh, uh, again, uh, inducers, inhibitors, to decide the right treatment to prescribe to our patients. So what about pleiotropic effects? Uh, this is a, a, an old story uh, to discuss 20, uh, 20 years of, uh, of uh, story. And uh, LMWH uh, uh, can give us the, uh, the opportunity to have an anti-tumor activity because of angiogenesis inhibition, because of uh, uh, inhibition of cell adhesion. And then uh, we have several authors very involved in that topic. The first of all was Guy Meyer. Uh, Guy Meyer died last year and uh, I wanted to uh, say him hello 
uh, and Guy Meyer published the first study, Contanox, and the last study, Tilt, uh, and Tilt demonstrated that there was no effect of uh, anticoagul anticoagulation on, uh, on uh, cancer. That is not a good anti-cancer treatment. So, end of the story. Another pleiotropic effect is the cost. And we have uh, many uh, uh, publications, but that one was, uh, was interesting and the last uh, publicated, uh, uh, my knowledge, it was in the lung, the COSTAT study. It was a, an observational study and uh, uh, you can see that the, the cost is uh, very important uh, with patients um, uh, meeting VTE. As you can see, the, the hospital, hospitalization needs uh, are the most important uh, uh, way of cost, uh, with a total average cost uh, for patients uh, at uh, 11,000 uh, euros per patient for six months. The hospitalization was the highest uh, cost, uh, had the highest cost, and the uh, anticoagulation therapy only LMWH, there was no drugs in the study, was at 20% of, uh, of the cost. So it is uh, important in the economic approach uh, and uh, we have to discuss and to define what will be the best treatment. And there are several studies uh, comparing drugs to uh, LMWH treatments, and uh, maybe with a benefit for, for drugs, but it has to be worked more. So uh, what about VTE and risk uh, of cancer? I wanted to uh, highlight this, uh, this study published last year uh, with the, uh, the riot uh, cancer score items. And you can see that we have five items um, within is uh, the previous uh, uh, VTE showing that there are patients at low risk to develop cancer and patients at higher risk. And the patient, um, the, pe the people who will have VTE in their story will uh, probably uh, are at uh, highest risk of having cancer in the future. So this is a multidisciplinary approach. CAT uh, is very important. And I, I wanted to, uh, to show you that, uh, that study, um, uh, Allothrombosis Cancer, a multidisciplinary care program, uh, interesting, with uh, an improvement of adherence to guidelines practice at month three, month six. And uh, there was no effect on uh, uh, recurrent VTE, deaths, or bleeding. But it was interesting to uh, impact the guideline practice. Another study is the pharmacist approach in the same field. It's important to discuss with the pharmacist. And as you can see uh, on, uh, on that prospective uh, study, there was an increase again in guidance adherence when uh, there is a discussion with the pharmacist at the start of the anticoagulation treatment. The other question is in the long term. So what will happen? Uh, we have this, uh, this first study, interesting, with patients and uh, that was an observational study with patients with apixaban five milligrams uh, bite and uh, uh, at uh, uh, six months the patient will receive only two that five milligrams two times a day for 30, 30 months and you can see that there was a decrease of bleedings in uh, in the the second part of the treatments uh, when reducing the posology of apixaban and it is because we have this APICAT study, an ongoing study um, with uh, 1,500 patients enrolled in the, in, the, in the study. And it's a comparison between apixaban a full dose, 5 milligrams uh, BID, to uh, apixaban reduced dose to that 5 milligrams BID uh, after six months of uh, good uh, anticoagulation. And we will see the results, I hope, next year. So this is the end of, uh, of the talk. And I wanted just to highlight this Canadian algorithm, uh, which can be compared to the AFSOS, the French speaking association uh, guidance that we have uh, published last year or two years ago. And we just have to look at the patient we have in front of us. We have to assess the risk of bleeding. We have to assess the location of the disease. We have to assess if there is drug, drug interaction or not. And then we have to discuss with the patient what does he uh, prefer, uh, injection or oral route? And then maybe uh, after this discussion, we can uh, uh, see uh, to other consideration, the reduced life expectancy, for example, the cognitive impairment, the age and the ECOG 
status of our patients to decide what will be the best treatment to propose to them. So just to remind you, the take-home message, supportive care makes excellent concept possible. This is a mask message. And just to invite you at the next ASOS meeting, French speaking association of supportive care and cancer in French at the end of October, of course, to the TAO Cancer Toxicity Management Digital Meeting, uh, 1st and 2 December end, of course. Please join us at the MASK meeting, end of June 23 to 25 uh, at Toronto. That will be a very, very great meeting. And we all wait for you uh, to, uh, to meet us. It will, this will be uh, an in-presence meeting. Please join us. Thank you very much for your attention. And I give the talk to Professor Simon Noble for the last part, and we will combine our discussion or the or, or questions at the end of the two talks. Simon, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. So let me just share my screen. And I am just assuming there that you can see this. If you can't, if Annie or someone can tell me they can't see anything, um, I will carry on. So thank you very much for this kind invitation to speak to you all. Um, and it's great to follow on from Florian because um, he set out really nicely the data that we have for cancer associated thrombosis. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. And I'd also point out I've sat on a few guideline groups, um, which is interesting because we've had different methodologies on each one. And as a result, you tend to get different results depending on how you ask the questions. I would also like to reiterate the, um, the encouragement Annie has given you and Florian about um, joining MASK or coming along to MASK um, in Toronto. Of all the professional organizations I've um, participated in, I think MASK is probably the most genuinely multi-professional convivial organization I've been involved in. And I think, you know, whatever aspect of cancer care you're in, um, oncology, supportive care, head and neck, speech and language therapy, pharmacy, psychology, et cetera, et cetera, it's an absolutely fantastic organization and it's incredibly welcoming as well. Nothing worse than going to these conferences where you've got the great and the good sat at the cool kids table, not talking to anyone. Um, here, you're going to actually find that those are the people who will be spending their time encouraging you to participate. So I thoroughly encourage you to um, get involved. The other thing that's important when we talk about cancer associated thrombosis is that this is an evolving area because our patients, the natural history of cancer has changed. If I think about patients with metastatic melanoma who I used to look after, who may only have a few months to live, you know, I'm now seeing these targeted anti-cancer therapies that are just obliterating the disease and people's prognosis has changed vastly. People are living longer with cancer. They're receiving um, systemic anti-cancer therapies for longer. And as a result of that, we're seeing an increase in VTE as well, because systemic anti-cancer therapies are such a strong risk factor for VTE. But the other thing that's happened is our patients are more empowered to make their wishes known. And also because we're now in a position with cancer associated thrombosis to have more than just the option of low molecular weight heparins or warfarin, patients have a choice. And what I would like to suggest is this. If we're in a situation where you don't make your systemic anti-cancer therapy decision um, without consulting a molecular mutation abnormality, you know, you, we're looking at molecular markers, which will tell us whether or not this patient will respond to that particular therapy. Why the hell are we trying to seek a single one size fits all anticoagulation regime? And it does need to be far more personalized not just based on the physiological parameters that the Canadian algorithm shows beautifully, but also what's important to the patient. What do they value most? What do they fear most? And this is being recognized even more in the guidelines and the ASH guidelines, um, you know, part of the introduction picks up very much that patient values and preferences are very important. I've had the privilege of, I see about, 
400 new cat patients a year in my clinics and you get, get a good feel for what's important to them and what things distress them. And one thing that's a cons consistent distress for them are those patients who are developing VTE at the beginning of their cancer journey when they start their systemic anti-cancer therapies. Now, I feel that as oncologists, we've done very well in warning patients of common side effects such as neutropenic sepsis and our patients have an established pathway down which to go having been alerted of all the red flag um, signals that they need to pick up on. But when we see that thrombosis has got as high a mortality rate as infection, um, I would ask you to just question whether in your organisation the risk of VTE is afforded the same level of attention when, um, when recruiting patients for their, cat for their um, chemotherapy and systemic anti-cancer therapies. The other thing to be considering, and this is an old slide now, but what it illustrates is even in 2015, and that's before the CAT studies had reported, um, people were using DOACs and they were using them because they believed that patients would prefer um, a tablet over an injection. But in this study, we looked at what things patients most valued um, for their cancer associated thrombosis. And if you look at this, they're looking at which things they, they felt were most important. And the number one thing was they wanted an anticoagulant that didn't interfere with their cancer treatment. They saw themselves as cancer patients first and foremost. The next most important thing is they wanted it to work. So something that actually worked as well and something that was safe. And then if those three things are met, they would prefer to have a tablet rather than um, rather than a, an injection. But the most important thing to them would be non-interference with their cancer journey and efficacy. So they would be saying, you know, there's no point in you giving me the best chemotherapy, um, only to give me the second best anticoagulant if I were to get, get that. So how do we help our patients make decisions? Well, I like to go back to my favorite book in the world, um, to Kill a Mockingbird, wonderful film as well as a wonderful book. Um, Gregory Peck was awarded an Oscar um, for his role as Atticus Finch and no one punched him either, which I thought is quite a nice turn up. And in this, he said, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside his skin and walk around in them. And what's even kind of I, I quite like about this is that when you think about the Mockingbird, that is just a fairly dull dull plumage, nothing particularly impressive about its beak or its tail. But the pelican, and we have we ran a study called pelican, is a far different beast. Everything about it is different. Although it is a bird, it looks different, it behaves differently, it feeds differently. And in the same way, when we're looking at patient experience, those who have a clot due to cancer or associated with the cancer journey will have different experiences and different values and different fears than people who've had a clot um, who don't have cancer. So we undertook a study called Pelican, the patient experience of living with cancer associated thrombosis. And this was a qualitative study initially done in the UK where we interviewed patients, analyzed the, um, the transcripts with framework analysis. And we found consistencies with these patients and there were three areas in their lives they would talk about with regards to CAT. There was the time before CAT where they really knew nothing about clots at all. There was the process of being diagnosed and receiving treatment and then there was them getting on with their lives and living with CAT. I'm just going to focus on one area and that is this life before cancer associated thrombosis. If I could just highlight this, because although this wasn't highly prominent in the Pelican study, it was prominent in the Canadian version and other studies after it. Patients who have an incidental PE, and we're seeing a lot of these, these patients will have been told they have cancer. They will have undertaken a scan, usually as part of staging, or maybe to evaluate disease status after some treatment. And invariably, this PE will be found on a scan, um, which has been done without the intention of looking for clots, but it's been found incidentally. 
The radiologist will report it, will let one of the medics know usually that there's, a, there's an issue and you need to get the patient in to anticoagulate. Now you think about your average way of breaking bad news to a patient to tell them they have cancer. It's done in a sensitive way with plenty of time to support them and access to information. These people are getting told over the phone. And if they don't want to come in straight away, patients will tell me they were traumatized having been told, if you don't come in quickly, you could die. For those who are having chemotherapy, then they've been consented for it. Patients would often say that they just weren't given information about CAT and the risks of CAT. And therefore, when they had symptoms, they assumed it was just the chemotherapy. Or if they didn't think it was the chemotherapy, maybe it was just an exacerbation of a pre-existing um, chronic condition they had. So our patients trust us to give us the information they need to know. And if we haven't told them about it, it can't have been important. The other thing that we find with patients is that when they've been given a diagnosis, if we don't give them adequate information about that, they will go on to that anarchic library called the internet and they will go and find out information for themselves. Now, if that is good information, fantastic, but they're still gonna learn that this is potentially life-threatening. It may be associated with a worse prognosis, or if they find some real rubbish, you know, that's gonna scare them even more. And when we look at themes of different countries, because we conducted interviews in Spain, Canada, France, New Zealand, and Singapore. And whilst we found that there were cultural differences, and there were also differences according to the different healthcare systems, the one thing that was consistent in every country was that patients reported a lack of information regarding clots prior to starting systemic anti-cancer therapies. Now, a few years ago, Anticoagulation UK which has no longer exists as a charity, but Thrombosis UK continues to do their work. Anticoagulation UK developed, partly based on the Pelican work, um, a patient information video called Cancer, sorry, Blood Clots, Cancer and You. And it is a very nice um, video explaining the risk of clots in the cancer journey, what to look out for, what to do if you have symptoms. And um, this was very, you know, it was really good. It was designed by a patient group. Leo Pharma offered um, technical support and finance to do this. And we introduced this as a video card into clinical practice at our local cancer center. Now, when I say a video card, you may be familiar with birthday cards that you open and they play a tune. Well, this is similar. It's a card with a little screen on it that has a preloaded pre video. And patients can sit there in the chemotherapy suite or they can sit there in the waiting room and watch this video at their leisure. But these, it doesn't matter how good and shiny this is, does it make a difference? So we got a small grant which allowed us to undertake the Empower project, which was to evaluate this patient designed tool to see if it actually made a difference to patient care. And we wanted to look at whether it altered patient understanding and awareness was it an acceptable intervention or did it cause people to be unnecessarily worried? Um, did it impact on patients' knowledge and skills? Because we did sometimes find there was resistance in, um, in the chemotherapy nurses from giving more information about clots because they didn't want to overburden patients. They didn't want to frighten them. And I think there is there any kind of objective evidence that this has improved care. So we were finding when we, we did an audit at the beginning of this study that it was taking on average nine days for a patient to present following symptoms suggestive of VTE. Now, if you imagine someone had kind of sat at home with symptoms of sepsis for nine days, that wouldn't be acceptable. And I don't think sitting there with nine days symptoms of red flag VTE is appropriate either. So this was a mixed method study where we had the six months before the video was introduced into practice, um, three months to allow the video to embed in practice, and then the following six months we collected data. So component one, we collected audit data looking at time to presentation from development of VTE symptoms to getting medical attention. We looked at radiology requests to see how many requests there were and what proportion 
were positive for VTE and what proportion were negative for VTE. Because if all we had done was doubled the work of the radiologists with not with no increased pickup of clots, um, you know, we're causing more work without actually improving patient care. We also undertook questionnaires for patients about the risks of clots, what to look out for. I'm um, a group of patients starting chemotherapy before they um, before the video card was introduced. And so once they had had their patient education, what what was their knowledge about it? And then we repeated this in a cohort of patients um, after the video card had been introduced. And we also undertook some interviews with key informants such as um, chemotherapy nurses and clinic nurses. So the most important result, I think, is this one, which shows that pre-video, it took an average of nine days for patients to present with their symptoms of VTE. And we saw this reduced by two thirds down to just under three days. Um, I think that is a very significant change because, of course, the longer a patient has a DVT without treating it, not only is there a greater risk that it is going to propagate and embolize, also you've got a greater risk of that person getting a bigger clot, increases the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome. And I am now seeing patients who are living many years with cancer, who their most distressing symptom is their post-thrombotic syndrome, which was as a result of a large clot damaging the veins, and it was picked up late. The other thing is if we look at the number of scans looking for VTE, um, statistically, there was no significant difference in the proportion that were negative. Um, it's about the same. The only thing we could say is that people were requesting the scan sooner and these clots were being picked up sooner, but it didn't have a noticeable increase in the proportion of scans being done. Um, and so we can't say when from 50 to 71, this just happens to be a reflection of how many patients were going through the system at the time. I think the proportion is far more telling. And then finally, I just want to share a couple of things which gives us an insight into the role of the nurse. And I really want to be very clear here. This is not a criticism. And I think whenever we talk, it's easy for me to wax lyrical about cancer associated thrombosis and how important it is. But for my oncology colleagues, that is just one of many complications of systemic anti-cancer therapies. And even more so now that we have these targeted therapies, some of which can have absolutely hideous side effects and the whole person falls apart. So I recognize that this is just one aspect of caring for a patient um, and they need to actually have a much wider view and knowledge. So this is not as straight, as clear cut as it is looks. So when we asked about what patients kind of say about clots, they tended to give it a low priority. Um, I just say they're at more risk of clots. I don't really tell them why. I probably only say a, pen, a, a sentence. I don't really know why they're getting an increased risk. I don't understand the mechanisms. So that's probably why we don't go into detail you tend to focus on what you understand and you can explain that. If you're not sure about something, you glance over and hope they don't ask many questions. Um, so other things get prioritized like sepsis. People understand sepsis. You get an infection, infections go through your body, you get blood poisoning, that's bad. But when you're trying to understand Verkhoff's triad and the different thrombogenicities of different tumors and different types of chemotherapy, it gets more complex. And so when given a choice, people will prioritize the things that they feel are most important. And the other thing, of course, is you don't want to overburden patients. So you're going to try and give them, you know, if you just give them, say, one thing, give them sepsis. The other thing is that people will be will follow what the information leaflets are. And so there tends to be checklists to make sure people have um, taken on board the risks. And what people would report is that actually um, yes, we mentioned clots, but we don't talk much about it. And it's right down the bottom of the list. And one person even reported they used a national booklet. And when they removed the booklet and had a look, clots weren't mentioned. So at a national level, we're not doing enough here. So if I just finish, what I would say, first of all, is cancer associated thrombosis is everyone's business. And it's not something you just look at at the beginning of someone's chemotherapy journey. It's something you look out throughout. We certainly know with certain agents, there is a cumulative effect of risk over time. 
and also the risk will wax and wane. So we all have a role in educating patients. You all have a role in assessing patients and supporting them as well. Don't underestimate the psychological impact of a CAT for these patients. I think generally the amount of information patients get prior to systemic anti-cancer therapies could be improved. Um, we do know that the level of distress people have may be cultural, but if you understand what's going on and you've been forewarned of it, the psychological distress is less. And the way I would reflect on that is think about patients who've had a febrile neutropenia. Um, because you've told them that this is a normal part of the cancer journey, you're likely to get this. People just expect it and they don't worry too much because it was all going to plan. And I actually think if we can do one thing here, we should normalize CAT. It is so common in chemotherapy that we should tell people it's quite it's quite possible that you will get you will get a clot. Increased knowledge will increase compliance, either with the injections or the tablets. Um, and I would suggest that we need to individualize our approach to CAT even more. I think the video is just one component. It is not enough to sit there and give someone a video. Some people do very well watching videos. Some people prefer it to be spoken to them. Some people prefer the written. I think you need to use a combination of all of them, but also give them the opportunity to go back to this information. So thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to answering questions with the rest of the panel. Okay, I'm just coming on. Thank you. So thanks to the folk that have asked questions so far. That's great. Thank you. Hi. Thank, thanks to everybody who, who've asked the questions so far. These were two brilliant talks and really came together in the individ, individualized care and personalized care that we have. Um, Jocelyn, the wonderful um, uh, webinar person from, from Mass staff, um, had already put out to ask some questions. So we had some questions about um, for this webinar before we started. And I would just like to start with them before going on to the audience today. Um, the first one was, I think I'm going to give this one to, to Simon. Um, so, so we didn't really mention prophylaxis today, but we want to shift to thinking that if we can prevent clots um, um, with pharmacological um, agents, that would be good. But that would be the best uh, kind of model. But, but um, what about prophylaxis in advanced cancer patients, somebody's asking? Okay, Annie. So I think the first first challenge of answering that is what your definition of advanced cancer is. Um, if one is saying metastatic disease, um, people are living with metastases for several years now and are having ongoing um, anti-cancer therapies. And so if we were talking about those, um, I would say that we have mixed data on those. We had some studies with low molecular weight heparin and an ultra low molecular weight heparin. The Protex study um, was one of these. And what it showed was that the rate of VTE was reduced from about 7% to 3.5% in patients with metastatic disease receiving chemotherapy. But the numbers needed to treat were not considered um, low enough for clinicians to feel it would alter practice. So rather than a kind of a broad blunderbuss, um, then they would wanted to look at, can we risk stratify these people more? So we've recently had Avert and Cassini, which were a couple of studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where patients were risk assessed according to the Karana score, which is a score which identifies people at higher risk of VTE. And those who had a higher Karana score were randomized to have um, a DOAC or no DOAC. And once again, it showed a, um, a relative risk reduction of about 50% um, of VTE. But I would suggest that um, I think the, the results differed slightly. And I think it really is dependent on how you view the results as to whether you feel it is strong enough to um, impact on your clinical practice. I think um, there are differences of opinion. Some of the guidelines are recommending them, some aren't. 
what I would say is pancreatic cancer and myeloma, definitely. And then if we talk about patients near the end of life, what I think we've got good data on now, especially from our French colleagues who looked at hospice patients, um, it showed that you've got a risk of about 7.8% of bleeding in patients in a hospice. And that is most associated with primary prophylaxis or non-steroidal use. And actually that risk increases in those patients up to about 11%. Um, there's some other data from the UK which shows that anticoagulated patients have an increased risk of bleeding in the last couple of weeks of life. So I think someone who's nearing the end of life, I would be veering away from thromboprophylaxis. Um, I think then if they had a symptomatic clot, you should be treating symptomatically. I mean, last week I was referred a 91 year old lady with advanced metastatic disease and a low hemoglobin who was started on um, anticoagulation for a segmental PE for which she had no symptoms. I don't think that is an individualized attitude to care. Um, and so I think, you know, patients near the end of life, I'd have a low, lower threshold to stop. Thanks, Simon. So again, assess your patient in front of you, um, listen to your patient, hear what they're saying, and also then act on, on the basis of the assessment. So thank you for that. Florian, this is one that came in for before. I think you've answered it. Do you use um, DOAX in your daily clinical practice for, for um, cancer-associated thrombosis? In the curative intent, yes. Uh, it's an interesting question. I think I have demonstrated in my talk <laughs> Uh, what I do in the daily practice because I follow the, the, the results of the publications. Uh, yes, we can, we can use DOACs. We can use also LMWH. We have to use the population for patients with cancer. That's the most important message. And uh, we have to assess the risk to go back to the, to the question to ask to, uh, to, to Simon. And uh, we, we, we have to diagnose the, uh, the, the VTE uh, event. Uh, in our patients. So uh, to use the act, yes, but we have to decide which patient is the best one to receive LMWH or DOAC. As I have presented in the, in the slide by uh, uh, Max Carrier, uh, Marc Carrier uh, from, uh, from Canada, uh, we, 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 we have to see what patient we have in front of us we have to discuss with him. We have to see if there's a risk of bleeding, if there's a risk of drug-drug interaction, if there's a, a, a resected tumor or not, and then we can decide what is the best treatment. We have to avoid any bleeding, any adverse event related to our treatment, to the, to the anticoagulation. So um, discuss with the patient, assess the risk, assess the, the, the situation, and then prescribe the best treatment. But yes, we can use the act in the, in the daily practice for cancer patients. And with lines with um, upper limb thrombosis, do you use DOAX, Florian? So, sorry, with, with what? With upper limb, with cancer um, catheter related thrombosis? Yeah. Yeah, good. Assessing the patient. So same, same criteria, assessing the patient. Thank you for that. And last question from before is, um, oh, one, a really, really interesting question about, um, recommendations for birth control for cancer patients, given the increased um, risk of, of thrombosis, both from oral contraceptives and, and also from the cancer. And, and I wonder if it's um, phone a friend and phone an expert. Um, can I give that one to you, Simon, please? I think, um, I think the advice on any cancer-associated um, thrombosis issue is if you're not sure, um, talk to another colleague or get an MDT decision so that you can actually have a consensus. Um, I think it's very hard to say that the use of the oral contraceptive pill in the cancer setting offers a significant increase. I think um, I suspect the cancer and the systemic anti-cancer therapy risks will supersede those things. So I think you've got to look at all of the things together. If this person is overweight, their BMA is up and they have a particularly thrombotic cancer and they're having an agent which we know is associated with a high rate. Yes, of course, you're going to be, you know, in, on an individual basis, giving thromboprophylaxis. But let's not forget that giving thromboprophylaxis to patients 
or anticoagulating someone fully, if you do that for every patient, you're then going to start losing the benefit because there is a bleeding risk, you know, with anticoagulants as well. And so, you know, really, I think you need to be targeting those who are at greatest risk. And you also do need to be increasing awareness of VTE. So although breast cancer is one of the least thrombogenic of the cancers, it's probably one of the commonest that I see in clinic because the cancer itself is so common and so many people are now having adjuvant chemotherapy. So I think it's very hard to isolate it into just yeah. one thing. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and a really good question that we don't often get asked. So that's really good. Um, Florian, VEGF inhibitors, um, um, any any data on either arterial um, thrombo thrombobolic thrombolic events or um, or venous thromboembolism? Yes, very huge question. We we don't With have many DOAX. data. Yes, we, we don't have many data. We we uh, I remember one publication uh, last at the end of last year of 2021 in the Oncologist and uh, uh, with uh, VGF TKA. Uh, patients, uh, there was an increase of um, of uh, bleedings uh, with patients combining uh, v, uh, VGF and uh, TTI and uh, an anticoagulation. Uh, so we have to be cautious of them of that. But we 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 published we we presented uh, from Gustavo Rossi an abstract to the the mask meeting last year uh, with patients under DOAC. Uh, with uh, VEGF treatment uh, within uh, uh, bevacizumab uh, therapies. And we have not seen any impact in this retrospective study. So this, these are the, the two, uh, the, the two uh, trials that I have uh, in mind, retrospective studies, and uh, one with uh, impact on safety and the other one without any impact on safety. So trials should be ongoing and to, to, to decide, but uh, we, we have to be careful with our patients and with the treatment we, we give them. So if we're thinking about bevacizumab and non-small cell lung cancer patients, that um, you know, there's been a couple of studies showing no increase in venous thromboembolism, but the arterial is, is up as well. So just it's, again, the individualized patient. So, so thank you. And we hope to see your, your, next, your next poster or your next presentation at this year's meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, another one, Florian, for you, Castadiva forest plot, the one that you showed, the, the, the latest forest plot, it said, it seems that the oldest DOAC studies had a higher rates of ma major bleeding, so that's um, Hokusai um, and VTE cancer, and also, also Select D, when compared to the more recent one. Um, can we do we think that the investigators um, got the, the results of these studies and were thinking more carefully about their, their sample, their patient population? Great question. Maybe yes, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Simon. Uh, probably probably, probably we, we, uh, we have a bit of knowledge of the treatment and we, we better prescribe them. But we are in clinical trials. So normally, we have to, to get the same patients. We have to, to, to balance the characteristics of the, of the patients. But probably we, we prescribe better the treatment now. Simon? I think Simon. the, um, I mean, I was present in a Caravaggio investigators meeting where the discussion was, should we take out upper GI cancers from the, and the decision was, no, we're going to keep them in because we don't know that it's a class effect we, or, you know, if it's particular to one. So from an investigator perspective, there was no problem in recruiting, you know, the desire to recruit these patients. In fact, people wanted to because we wanted to answer that question. I think in reality, there's a lot of, res lot of the researchers who were putting patients in who were less willing to put the GI cancers in particular in. And so I think that's why I think we actually had a smaller proportion of the cancers. But one could also argue that the um, bleeding signal of apixaban, when we looked at the other studies in AF, et cetera, you know, was slightly more favorable as well. And so it's, um, it's very difficult to know. But I would say that our practice is 
we try and get patients over to a DOAC, but the things that will stop us are if there's significant drug-drug interactions, if it is a GI cancer where the endoluminal tumor is still present, a urothelial cancer, um, or if there are problems with the hepatic and renal function. Thank you. Thank you for that. Listen, we've only got a, a couple of minutes left and Rahul's asking the, the big question, how long's long enough, um, Florian, for extended treatment after six months? So most of the, the studies were six months select. You had a tiny number of patients for 12 and we've got, you know, you, you gave the, the APICAT study as well, the we're waiting on the results. How long is long enough? We have to follow the treatment until cancer is active and until uh, treatment, uh, anti-cancer treatment is, uh, is, uh, is active. So after six months without active disease and without active treatment, we can stop the treatment, the anticoagulation. If, if cancer is active or treatment is active, we have to follow the, the anticoagulation. And then okay. we have to decide that's, after that's, six months... That's... That's very clear. And yeah. there, there is a, a group at low risk of, of, um, of um, uh, recurrent VTE and, and there are some subgroups of patients that we can look at as well that we can stop. Active cancer, the best rule, that's great. And Rahul's also asking, um, it, most of the studies have been done with chemotherapy drugs, yeah? At, at the time the patient said, are there any data on, you know, people not undergoing active treatment with chemotherapy or, or systemic anti-cancer therapy, I should say? Simon, you want to answer? So <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question is. I mean, the any question patient is, can... Is there enough data to advise DOACs in those not receiving cancer-directed therapy? Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, basically, if anything, it's not to do with the fact that there, are, yes, the cancer is a risk, the, the chemotherapy or the systemic anti-cancer therapy is a risk factor for VTE, but it's not why we're using the DOAC. If anything, the, the new systemic anti-cancer therapies can sometimes inhibit us using them because um, certainly some of the newer agents have got CYP3A4 and p glycoprotein um, activity. So, you know, we still have a fair number of patients who you will find they've got the cancer present and we found the clots incidentally, they don't go on to have treatments. Absolutely no problem using these people regardless of the, um, the kind of treatments. You know, we can treat them all the same so long as there aren't drug-drug interactions or a bleeding risk. Thank you. Tom, we're going to answer your question online because everybody's interested. So most of the time the patients spend at home in the community and we want to know much more about um, community input. So we'll do that one um, online. And also to the anonymous um, person who said, um, what about brain metastasis? And we've got an answer from that. But unfortunately, we've come to end of time. Thank you to these two brilliant presenters. Thank you, Jocelyn, for your great IT skills in, in getting this webinar together. Thank you to Leo Farmer for sponsoring the webinar because it's just been great. And huge thanks to the audience because these questions were fabulous. And we have uh, um, two hemostasis sessions, um, Meet the Expert and something else, um, at, at MASK in Toronto in, in June. So hopefully see you there, either online or in Toronto. Thanks very much indeed and bye-bye.